This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. When a spectacular solar eclipse plunged much of Mexico into darkness, no one imagined that the event would spawn an astounding wave of UFO sightings, sightings experienced by thousands of eyewitnesses all across Mexico and captured on dozens of home videos. On June 7, 1992, 36-year-old Sammy Wheeler was found shot to death in his car, and the small town of Stanton, Virginia was overrun with rumors. Incredibly, Sammy's twin brother, Sammy's old girlfriend, and her ex-husband of taking turns accusing each other of the murder. But still the question remains, who killed Sammy Wheeler? And perhaps someone watching can provide a happy ending to the poignant story of Gordon Page Jr. Only after years of misdiagnosis did Gordy's parents learn that their son was suffering from autism. Then in 1991, Gordy vanished from the group home in which he had been placed. Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve the mystery. Usually when we hear that a person in some remote community has had a UFO sighting, we respond with a smile and a shake of the head. When three or four credible people report seeing a mysterious craft, we may pay just slightly more attention. But when thousands of people claim to have seen the same strange object and hundreds provide videotape evidence, we may begin to think that maybe, just maybe, there is more than a grain of truth to the reports. Which brings us to the fantastic saga of the Mexico UFOs. July 11th, 1991, the last total eclipse of the sun in this century, perhaps the most spectacular celestial event of the past 200 years. For the residents of Mexico City, the eclipse prompted a festive celebration. Thousands took to the streets as one of the world's largest cities was plunged into total darkness in the middle of broad daylight. No one imagined that the entire country was about to be swept up in a wave of UFO hysteria. That afternoon, a television executive named Guillermo Araguin was videotaping the eclipse when he noticed an unusual object overhead. It was presented on the news. It was said that a very strange object was over Mexico City, but nobody said what it was. When I saw it, I said, oh my God. This is a UFO, a real UFO. I mean, you can look at it, you can look at the video and be absolutely convinced. What are you looking at? Jaime Maussan is one of Mexico's most respected television journalists. For the past nine years, he has produced, directed, and hosted Mexico's edition of 60 Minutes, or 60 Minutos. Eight days after the eclipse, Jaime presented the Araguin footage as part of a special UFO broadcast. The network was inundated with phone calls. We asked the people in Mexico to bring or their videos to us because we like to see if, if in the clips they had recorded the same stuff. The telephone lines blew up. I mean, 40,000 calls at the same time. Then the, the system was completely shut out. We received more than 15 videos, and we now know for sure that at least in seven of them, we can see the same, exactly the same ship that was recorded by Guillermo Arreguin. One of the many videos was sent by Eric Aguilar, a 19-year-old student at National University of Mexico. 
He was setting up to film the eclipse from a rooftop when his girlfriend spotted something unusual in the sky. We all turned to look. My girlfriend commented that it was a UFO, but we thought it was a joke. No one really believed her when she said she saw a UFO. But within moments, they all decided that the object was not a joke at all. At first, all we saw was a white dot in the sky. That's all we could see in the beginning. Later, we saw that this dot was shining brightly. It, it must have been a very bright star. And we didn't realize it at first. We didn't realize it until we saw the videotape later. We saw that this dot, it, it wasn't a dot anymore. It was a larger object, and it was giving off light. It was shining. At virtually the same time, 60 miles from Mexico City, a businessman named Luis Lara photographed a similar object. As I raised the camera, you could see something in the clouds. And it was a metal object. And it looked like it was made of two plates. You can distinguish a dome, and it turned on its own axis. It was silver-plated, a color like aluminum. You could see clearly it's not a star. It's a UFO because it had a shadow underneath. If it were a star or a planet, you, you would see clearly that it would be completely luminous. But this one had a little shadow underneath. Yet another video was shot by the Breton family in Puebla, a city 80 miles east of Mexico City. Magnifying the Breton video revealed an odd wave-like disturbance behind the pulsating disk, perhaps some kind of energy trail. Jaime Maussan enhanced the Aragin footage and compared it to the Breton tape. The objects, though photographed nearly 100 miles apart, were remarkably similar in every aspect. Uh, the video from Puebla was absolutely identical to the one we had seen with Arreguin in Mexico. Uh, it was for the first time in history. Never before we, you had a tape of two UFOs in two different places at exactly the same moment. The videos caused a sensation throughout Mexico, but the UFO craze was just beginning. Two months later, an engineer named Vincente Sanchez took his video camera to a military air show in Mexico City. I was following one of the planes and I saw a shiny dot in the camera. I didn't know what it was, but it seemed to be moving, it was undulating. So I let the planes go off and I focused more on this shiny dot in the sky. What I saw was a bright, round object, about 10 meters in diameter. It was made of silver, was shining very brightly, and reflected the sunlight a lot. It didn't fly like a plane, it was undulating. The object appeared, undulated, and moved around very quickly. A year later, a similar object was videotaped at the same air show. This time, the disk descended rapidly and mysteriously disappeared. By the time the 1993 air show rolled around, people anticipated another sighting. Sure enough, just as a squadron of helicopters flew by, the familiar metallic disk appeared. It was traveling against the wind, so much so that had it been a balloon, considering the force of the helicopter blades, it would have crashed. But no, it kept on its path very, very straight and steady till it got lost in the sky. Optical enhancement of this video seems to reveal that the object crossed in close proximity to the helicopters. Curiously, the military has consistently declined to address the matter. The military hasn't made any comment on that sighting or any sighting. And there are many more where we can relate the military or military planes to videos. And however, 
we haven't had any kind of answer from them. Since the eclipse in July of 1991, there have been thousands of sightings throughout Mexico. There is no clear pattern, although the great majority have occurred in and around Mexico City. The witnesses range from pilots to doctors to bus drivers and even school children. These drawings are made by a class of fifth graders who allegedly saw UFOs in March of 1993. The pictures are strikingly similar in detail. Three shining lights with the brightest light in the center. The objects were silver with red. One of them was coming down, and the other one that you could see in the sky was silver. When they were a little lower, you could see the shape of the objects. They were like saucers with a dome, everything silver. And though it was harder to see, there seemed to be a kind of reddish magnetic field all around it. We haven't found a single reason why these little kids made this story up. There were so many, and when you talk to them, you can feel the honesty that they transmit. They're just little kids. They don't care about the UFO conspiracy. They don't care about if they are real or not. They saw what they saw. People really like UFOs. People really believe in UFOs. And we are now convinced that we are living an incredible experience as a country, as a society, because it's everywhere. It's not just one people, it's many people with their eyes in the sky and a camera in their hands. Now it's the video era, and the video is going to solve the UFO mystery. Are the Mexico UFOs real? It is difficult to deny the startling images captured on videotape though a determined skeptic would no doubt find some basis to discount the entire episode. But for those who have actually witnessed the mysterious objects in the skies over Mexico, seeing is believing. Next, a bizarre murder mystery in which three people, including the victim's twin brother, accuse each other of pulling the trigger. On June 7, 1992, the George Washington National Forest in Virginia was visited by murder. That morning, the body of 36-year-old Sammy Wheeler was found in the back seat of his sport vehicle. Sammy had been shot six times in the head and upper torso. Both the local sheriff's department and the FBI investigated. They quickly determined that the killer had gone to great lengths to clean the crime scene. All shell casings and fingerprints had been removed, and an amateurish attempt had been made to destroy the evidence. There was an apparent uh, effort to try and uh, ignite the, uh, uh, the vehicle. There was some paper and tissue uh, stuffed in the gas cap. The gas cap had been opened, and it apparently uh, a cigarette uh, laid there lit in an effort to try. There was some burning around there, but it, it didn't ignite and didn't take effect. When investigators discovered that Sammy's wallet was missing, the case took on all the earmarks of a random act of violence. But before long, it would be revealed that at least three people in Sammy Wheeler's life might have wanted him dead. Sammy's twin brother, Danny, Sammy's girlfriend, Pat Sneed, and Pat's estranged husband, Bob Bean. What had begun as a routine investigation quickly became a classic drama of love, lies, and murder. In the months following Sammy Wheeler's death, Danny Wheeler, Pat Sneed, and Bob Bean took turns accusing each other of the crime. In this bizarre and convoluted case, the principals agree on only one thing. It all started when Sammy Wheeler began dating Pat Sneed. In the fall of 1991, Pat moved into a rental unit owned by Sammy's twin brother, Danny. The property had been divided into separate apartments. Pat and her two sons lived in one apartment with Sammy. Danny lived in one of the others. The arrangement suited everyone, except Pat's estranged husband, Bob Bean. The situation 
was not really what was in the best interest of my children. I had approached Patton and asked her to please stop this living arrangement here, okay? We won't get into responses, but uh, anyway, I, I felt that I was forced into going to court to at least provide some kind, or try to provide some kind of moral environment for my children. In February, a court order was issued that prohibited Sammy from being with Pat in the presence of the boys. To comply, Sammy moved into his twin brother's apartment. Bob Bean remained suspicious. He hired a private investigator to ensure that the court order was being obeyed. Bob's private investigator came in and testified that Sammy had violated the court's order. Sammy never found out whether or not the judge believed that. I know for sure Sam did not violate that court order. But just to be safe, he stayed away from the house then. He was living in a truck without even a bathroom or a shower just to appease Bob Bean. So where are you going to stay tonight? Probably stay in the car. I hate it when you sleep in the car. I can't give them any more ammunition they've already got. I never harbored any ill will at all towards Sam. People around here have a hard time understanding how a man can accept that his wife is leaving him for another man. Well, to be honest with you, I knew what I had, and I was thankful to pass it on, OK? But after getting to know Sam, I, felt, I kind of felt sorry for him, and I wanted to sit down and prepare him for what he was getting. Bob hated Sam. Sam knew it, and I knew it. Bob says otherwise, because I believe Bob is a pathological liar. Sam expressed to me that he felt that my ex-husband, Bob, was capable of pretty much anything. He did not trust him. On June 3rd, four days before he was murdered, Sammy left Danny's apartment at 5.30 a.m. and chanced upon an unexpected visitor, Bob Bean's teenage son from a previous marriage. Come here. What are you doing? Just taking a few pictures. Yeah, I see that. Will you tell your dad I'm staying in the apartment, OK? With Danny. I'm not in the house. I'm not with Pat. I'm not with the kids. I'm with my brother in the apartment, just like I'm supposed to be. OK, I'm, I'm just taking some pictures. OK, we'll cut it out, huh? All right. No more pictures, got it? No more pictures. All right. I thought that was very, very strange for somebody to be taking my twin brother's photograph at 5.30 in the morning. I didn't like it at all. That Saturday, at around 9.15 PM, Sammy set off for Elkhorn Lake, approximately 40 miles from his house. He planned to spend the night in his truck and begin fishing early the next day. Twelve hours later, Sammy Wheeler was dead. I believe Bob Bean had a motive to kill my brother. Pat's divorce from Bob was going to be final on Tuesday. They were going to be married on Thursday. Sammy was killed on Sunday, just by coincidence just by coincidence. Sure it was. Sure it was a coincidence. Sure it was. And I'm Michael Jordan, too. I used to play for the Chicago Bulls. Go talk to the people who know me, OK, and ask them if I was really upset if Pat was leaving. OK, the answer to that is no. So there's no motive. On the face of it, Bob Bean was a perfect suspect, but he also had what appeared to be the perfect alibi. When Sammy was murdered, Bean was on maneuvers with his Army National Guard unit. The night that he was killed, I was on duty until 11 o'clock that night. Now, the death certificate indicates the time of death at 1 o'clock. The camp that I was at is about 150 miles away. There was no way that I could physically get from the camp to the murder scene in that 
amount of time to kill Sam. It's just physically impossible. One of our men from our department at the time was in the same unit and remember seeing Bob there. So things checked out pretty good for him. I feel like that Bob Bean knew just as soon as Sam Wheeler was found dead, he knew they were gonna come knocking on his door. So he knew that he better have his story right. Danny Wheeler believes that Bob Bean later gave the photographs that his teenage son took to a professional hitman. You'd have to pay for the hitman and the FBI investigated my finances, and I, I don't have quite what it takes to pay a professional. There was uh, nothing at all um, to support the theory of Bob hiring someone. That, that just didn't go anywhere with the investigation. In the end, Bob Bean was cleared as a suspect. But the question remained, who murdered Sammy Wheeler? As far as alibis go, the only one who really doesn't have an alibi, according to what she's told me, is Pat. Bob Bean first began to suspect Pat a week after the murder, when their sons, ages three and four, began talking about the crime scene in surprising detail. Daddy's the bad guy shot Sam. Yes, I know that. Some very bad guy shot Sam. He was in a trooper. That's right. He was found in his car. We went to the mountain. You did? When did you go to the mountains? When Sam got shot. You At first, I didn't think much of it. But later on, they started getting a little bit more specific and offering a little bit more details. And all of a sudden, when they would come to visit, I noticed that they were exhibiting some definite behavior, uh, which was suggestive that uh, they were scared, they were frightened. Hey, now let me just make sure that the camera's working all right. Bob Bean was so convinced that he even videotaped his sons and then presented the tape to the police. Who was there when Sam died? Mommy. Mommy was there? Yeah. I believe Bob is a very, very sick man. The fact that he would put his kids in the position that he has, his little two and three-year-old children at that time, through what he put them through, proves that he has no scruples, no morals, he cares about no one, not, all, not even his own flesh and blood, little infant children. He is a sick, sick man. You know, In the end, the police dismissed the boy's testimony as unreliable. Investigators also believed that Pat had an airtight alibi. I'll see you later. I'm going to be in the living room if you need anything, so give me a call. Okay. The night that Sam was killed, I was at home alone with my two children. I had absolutely no motive to kill Sam Wheeler. Sam was, Sam and my children were my life, and I planned for them to be for a long time. Pat Sneed was eliminated as a suspect. Perhaps not surprisingly, Bob Bean soon raised yet another possibility. There's only two things that can come between brothers twin brothers that I'm aware of. It's money and a woman. That's all I gotta say. I, you know, I don't offer anything. I'll let somebody else make the accusations. Immediately after Sam was killed, um, the only person that I had in mind who I thought did it was my ex-husband. I have since then, um, uh, had time, lots of time, as you know, to uh, think about things that have happened and uh, to wonder, you know, if somebody else could have had a reason for wanting Sam dead. Sam's brother, Danny, may have wanted him out of the way. The reason for that, I have been told, is that Danny was in love with me. Pat says that shortly after Sammy's death, Danny made a surprising confession to one of her girlfriends. She just said that Danny Wheeler told her that he was in love with me, 
that he had been in love with me for a long time, that he thought about me every night, that he wanted to hold me in his arms every night. There's not an ounce of truth in those allegations. She, if she married my brother, she was going to be like a sister to me, and my family doesn't go in for incest. She, I, she never once physically attracted me even before Sam got involved with her. I didn't think she was a good-looking woman. On the morning of Sammy's body was discovered, his father and Sergeant Height broke the news to Danny and Pat. He's dead, son. Oh, no. Danny, I need Pat to know believes Danny's hysterical reaction was a clever ploy to hide the fact that he was the killer. Why don't you go get Bob Bean? He's trying to help He's down the road. Why don't you go get him? You know it's him. Why don't you go get him? Dad, I told you long ago it was Bob Bean. He doesn't know. We don't know anything about him. Go to Bob Bean. Get out of my way. Danny! What? This is not going to happen. I think most of his behavior when he first found out that, that Sam was dead was a show, was to make everybody else, basically, more than likely the law enforcement people, more than anybody else, to uh, think that he was uh, feeling some way that he wasn't. I think he was putting on a show for them. Why is she lying, it makes me wonder. What is she hiding, it makes me wonder. God knows what that did to me when my brother died and why she would say things like that makes me wonder about her. Maybe Bob Bean didn't kill my brother. Maybe it was Pat that killed my brother. As for Danny, the police confirmed that he also has an alibi. On the night of Sammy's murder, Danny was seen bar hopping until the early morning hours. Pat uh, Sneed, Bob Bean, and, and Danny Wheeler would, would not be considered any more suspects uh, in this case than, uh, than anyone else at the, at the present time. They, they, they've provided alibis. We've corroborated them. They've uh, taken a polygraph. Uh, they've shown no deception. Uh, they are no more uh, of a suspect in, in, in our eyes than, than anyone else at the present time. Who killed Sammy Wheeler? Despite all of the accusations and denials, the FBI has concluded that Sammy was the victim of random violence. The local authorities, however, believe that Sammy Wheeler may have known his killer. When we return, a mother and father hope you can help solve the mysterious disappearance of their son, Gordon Page Jr. This is Gordon Page Jr. at 18 months of age. He was born autistic and the results were tragic. Not because of the autism, but because Gordy was never correctly diagnosed his father, Gordon Page Sr., remembers. I guess maybe when he was real young, we thought something was wrong, but we didn't know what. He didn't walk like other kids and run like other kids. And as he got older, you know, he'd just sit there and look around and he didn't even move. They always told us that he was a big boy. He'd just be clumsy maybe, but then he'd outgrow it. He didn't really seem unusual to us because that was our first child and we just, we just raised him like a normal child. I and mean, he was slow. That's what, what we thought, he was just slow. Now, Gordon, I'm putting five pieces of fruit on the table. You see that? One, two, three, four, five. How many pieces of fruit are on the table, Gordon? Five. That's very good. Now, I'm gonna take the two apples away. Now, look down here. How many pieces of fruit are left on the table, Gordon? 22. Now, Gordon, come on. To his parents, Gordy was a paradox. At times, he seemed unable to grasp simple addition and subtraction. Yet, Gordy had a phenomenal memory, especially when it came to baseball. Ross Gibson, batting average, 193, 
home runs won. The baseball cards, he must, I would say, probably had 25 or 30,000 baseball cards, and he knew the names of every player, all the statistics of the cards, and he would just sit there and memorize them. Don Money, batting average, 223, home runs seven. I don't think that Gordy realized that he was slow. Bernie Carbo. In grade school, he had a lot of friends. And then as he got older, in junior high, his peers started advancing, you know, getting ahead of him. And when he needed tutorial help and he had to go into a special ed room, uh, it bothered him. And uh, he had a hard time in 11th and 12th grade because all his peers were dating, driving cars. Uh, going out and doing things, and he was much just a loner, actually, you know, because he couldn't keep up with everybody who was passing him by. Gordy worked hard to keep up. In June of 1981, he graduated from high school. His parents hoped he would be able to hold down a job and eventually helped him apply for one at a local grocery store. Then they held their breath and waited. He said, Dad, I got the job, he said. You know, it's minimum wage, $3.25 or 15 cents, whatever it was. But he said, I start Monday, isn't that great? And uh, it made me feel so happy and I dropped him off at work in the morning and uh, I would hide where he couldn't see me. And it made me feel proud as a father to see him working and to see him happy. Soon, however, the store manager reported that Gordy, although a conscientious worker, had trouble communicating with customers. His dad tried to coach Gordy at home using a video camera. You're carrying the groceries to my car now. And I say, thank you. What do you say? Good. No, you say, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. OK, let me see. Let's do it again. Thank you. What do you say? If nobody says anything, then you don't just smile at him. Let's see that nice Gordon Page smile. Come on, it's worth a million dollars. Let's see it. Come on, let's see it. Oh, yeah. If you see smile at people like that, they'll just love it. Gordy's winning smile was not enough. Good morning, Gordon. Things didn't work out at the grocery store, and he was let go. Eventually, both Linda and Gordon Page, worried sick about their son's future, met with social workers and asked for their evaluation of Gordy's case. Well... We're going to recommend that Gordon move to a group home. I've taken care of Gordy his whole life. This is his home. I don't think so. You folks won't be around forever. At this point, when you die, Gordon will be a lost soul. Finally, we agreed to try it, and we went to visit a group home and the lady said, well, he can't stay here until he goes to see if he needs to be stabilized on medication in the hospital. So we did this, we finally agreed, and uh, the doctor there put him on Ritalin and Valium, and Gordon wasn't Gordon after that. No. Go away! The combination of Ritalin, a stimulant, and Valium, a tranquilizer, plunged Gordy into a netherworld of physical and psychological torment. There isn't anything you can do, and all I do is call a doctor and tell him what was going on. And he said, don't worry about it. That's just typical for his illness, and it takes time for the medication to work. And I said, what is his illness? And uh, he said, well, whatever it is, there are signs of this and signs of that, but nobody would specifically come out and say this is what's wrong with him. For nearly five months, Gordy and his parents struggled with the medication. Where are we going? Just for the ride. We sit in the back, in the van. We love the van. Finally, the pages consulted another doctor, who told them that the combination of Ritalin and Valium was making Gordy virtually catatonic. In September of 1989, Gordy's family moved to Florida, 
Gordy stayed in Michigan. The preceding spring, he had been accepted at a highly regarded group home in Grand Rapids. For several months, all went well. Then, a near tragedy. On November 29, 1989, a workman left his truck running in the driveway. Gordy, heavily medicated, couldn't resist the temptation. Accident. Yeah. She gave us a description which fit uh, Gordon. Mm -hmm. Our officers then uh, received another call, a uh, call from one of our elementary schools that a person fitting Gordon Page's description was at this elementary school wanting to teach a class. So we responded to there and uh, at that time picked up Mr. Gordon Page. Do you remember driving that truck over there? Yeah. Also, you do realize you're involved in a car accident. Later, Gordy would tell his parents that all he had wanted to do was visit his younger brother away at college in Texas. Gordon Page. Gordy was subsequently placed in a county hospital. He was evaluated by psychiatric social worker Bill Arnold. One, six, seven, eight, five, what? He was brought in with a label of schizophrenia. What are you laughing about? People that are schizophrenic will uh, with medication over a couple of week period, usually they'll start to clear up in their thinking and their, their behavior will come in line and they, they start getting back more to normal. Uh, with Gordon, that didn't work. The more medication he got, the more that he, at times he became almost mute and just withdrew, didn't do anything. Tell me about the voices that you told the doctor about Gordon. I'm going home for Christmas, right? Yeah, I'm sure that we'll be able to get you out of here by Christmas time. After several months of intensive therapy with Gordy, Bill Arnold arrived at a surprising conclusion. He decided Gordy was not schizophrenic after all, but rather a high-functioning autistic. Tell me about your baseball card collection, Gordon. Woody Fry, 1966, Pirate Rookie of the Year. Pirate. Is he uh, your favorite player? Woody Fry. OK. Do you have other? Dal uh... Dalton Jones. Dalton Jones, 1961, batting average 322. Once we got him off all those medications and we started treating him as possibly an autistic and working on training and just giving him some respect, he was a totally different individual. Just a totally different individual than that withdrawn, acting out individual that we saw on medication. And we'll need you to sign this. The pages were confident that Gordy had at last been correctly diagnosed. Soon they found a group home in Grand Rapids which specialized in autism. But this says I can't visit Gordon. There was only one drawback. For two, months. For two, two months, months, no visitors two were months. allowed while Gordy adapted to his new environment. Mr. Page, I understand how you want the very best for your son. And so do we. We just want to give him his best shot at integrating with the program here. He's waiting for you. On May 22, 1991, Gordon Page Sr. was set to return to Florida. That afternoon, he shared an emotional goodbye with his oldest son. Hello, Gordon. How you doing, son? We kind of stood there and talked, and we hugged and uh, talked a little bit more. And then we walked over to the van, and I said, everything's going to work out.
Gordy seemed desperate for his father to stay. Against his better judgment, Gordon Page did not open the door. It was a decision he would come to regret. It's very painful. Now, in retrospect, I wish I had allowed him just to get in and crawl back and just driven right to Florida and come home. But you don't think of those things, and we didn't know what we were going to be facing in the future. The future came all too quickly. Four days after his father had left, Gordy disappeared. An orderly made the discovery during the regular midnight bed check. Around an hour later, a local fireman reported that he had seen someone who matched Gordy's description hitchhiking in the direction of Interstate 96. An intense police search of the area turned up no leads. I feel bad for Gordon. I feel bad as a parent that I wasn't able to find help earlier, that it had to be when he was 27, 28 years of age that we finally found out what was wrong. We just want our son back. We want to be reunited as a family, and we love Gordon very much. We will never stop looking for Gordy because we love him, and we've always been a close family. He would know that we would want him back. No, we will never stop looking for him. We love you, Gordy. What's your name? Hi, my name's Gordon Page. What's yours? Hi, my name's Gordon Page. What's your name? Join me in two weeks for a special two-hour edition of Unsolved Mysteries.